Stay with ABC News. Joining us now are two men who played key roles in preparing for East-West Summit meetings in the 1970s. Former Soviet diplomat Akarty Shevchenko helped brief Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev for the 1972 Nixon-Brezhnev Summit in Moscow. Former national security official William Hyland was involved in that summit and others with Presidents Nixon and Ford. Joining us in our New York studio is William Hyland, now the editor of Foreign Affairs magazine. And in our Washington bureau, Arkady Shevchenko, who defected to the United States in 1978. Mr. Shevchenko, you would go out back in the old days when you were part of that briefing team for Brezhnev, you would go out to his dacha, to his country villa, you and, and other Soviet officials, and what would you do out there? How would you prepare the old man? And he was getting to be an old man in those days. He was not uh, too old at that time. Uh, anyway, he was in the early 60s. Uh, but before we went uh, to Dacia, to Zavido, we, of course, uh, worked uh, for a long period of time for, for these uh, briefing papers, Pametka, it's called in Russian. But there, uh, Brezhnev uh, was uh, reading and studying there for a uh, long period of time. It was days, weeks. He we even put aside all the very important uh, other business in, in the Soviet Union. And there was uh, dozens of these uh, Pametka uh, briefing papers, three, four pages uh, each. Now, he, we, wanted, he wanted it simplified, though, right? He wanted to, to simplify them very much. He wanted them to be uh, short as possible, uh, because there was uh, dozens of them, and uh, he wanted them to, to make uh, as clear as, uh, as possible for, to, for him to understand. Now, uh, what, would be, what would be on those papers? I'm not talking about specifically, but in terms of categories. In, Sovi in, Soviet position, in, in, U.S. position? In terms of categories, it was, uh, first of all, of course, Soviet position. Then the, we tried to identify the point which uh, the American side would, uh, can raise and uh, answer to these uh, hypothetical uh, possible uh, questions. And some of the questions is a, a fallback uh, Soviet position. Could be the first position and second position or some alternatives in the, in the positions. That now, would be essentially... Once he got to the summit, I'm talking now about Mr. Brezhnev, he had a habit of personally coloring with three different colored <laughs> pencils, right? Those, yeah. those, those points. We didn't do that. It was... Uh, you didn't he, do it, but he, he did, right? He, he did. Yeah. He, he did. He has his own special uh, system and uh, tried to... I would mix up myself with all these things. And he, he, didn't trust a, he didn't trust anyone. He wanted to point at certain words uh, which he selected and picked up and used all these different colors. I, I'm, I'm afraid that only himself would understand well what well, was there. Sitting on the other side of the table in those days was Bill Hyland, and you were trying to read it upside down, right? Well, we tried. I don't think we were too successful. But we did see this uh, color code that uh, Brezhnev used, but I could never figure out uh, what was red and what was blue and what was yellow. But I noticed that he would tick these off. He would make a little check mark when he would finish with uh, a subject or a, a point he wanted to make. Uh, Brezhnev went through these things rather mechanically, and then after a period, he relaxed and went into a much more informal uh, mode. Now, as you hear Arkady talk about how Brezhnev was briefed, how did that compare to how our presidents are briefed? And, and does, it, does it vary from president to president? Do they like different ways of being briefed? Oh, I think they do, but the, my experience was almost a mere Arkady's. Uh, huge books with a great deal of information, background on almost every subject, but then boil down into one memo of, say, t 10 pages that's put on top that uh, the president actually uses, sometimes takes apart. But you must remember that that is for the first session, more or less, or the first day, and then you have to redo this. If the two leaders decide they want to shift subjects, which they often do, then you have to go into a kind of a crash course, uh, new memos, uh, cannibalizing old ones, and so forth. Now, in terms of the, of the duration of preparation, though, I mean, you hear that Brezhnev would, would sometimes seclude himself for weeks out there in the countryside. Did Mr. Nixon do the same thing, Mr. No. Ford? No, Mr. Nixon and Ford uh, did not, uh, to my knowledge, or to my remembrance, uh, spend a great deal of time. After all, you have to remember that this is not uh, something brand new for these people. They've arrived at the top of their profession because they've been in politics, public life, for a very long time, and they're rather comfortable uh, with this kind of procedure. All right, gentlemen, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to refocus your attention on that tiny little room with that very small table and those four chairs, two for the interpreters, one for the... And Brinkley, Sunday.
Continuing our discussion now with Arkady Shevchenko and William Hyland. Arkady, you and I were talking just before the program, and you told me about one occasion when Mr. Brezhnev and Mr. Nixon met alone with just their interpreters. And Mr. Brezhnev, for some reason, got lost on a rather arcane point of discussion about missile silos and effectively gave away the store. He turned around the what had previously been the Soviet position. It's, it's too arcane, and I don't want to get into all of that, but what happened afterwards when his advisors found out what he'd done? Oh, it was, uh, of course, a terrible thing. When uh, Gromyko and we learned about that, we were astonished uh, because we were supposed to... Uh, to we thought that uh, he understood properly the Soviet position. But uh, then, uh, quietly, uh, Gromyko started to undo all the thing and uh, explaining uh, in the conversation, in the private conversation, that uh, uh, Brezhnev was not exactly presenting in the accurate way the Soviet position. And, uh, he'd, he'd and gotten he gotten it exactly wrong, <laughs> in fact, hadn't he? Uh, oh, it was exactly wrong, of course, but uh, it's, it's not, uh, you cannot say about your leader that, you know, he's a stupid fool, idiot, made this <laughs> terrible mistake. Uh, it should be done in a more delicate uh, way, but, but we expected that the American side would uh, show some kind of understanding because <laughs> they knew it the next time it can happen with their leader. So And, and, and <laughs> did, the, did the American side, Bill, Highland, do you, do you remember this incident? Very well. I was there. And what happened? Uh, Kissinger made Gromyko sweat for about 45 minutes before he acknowledged that he knew Brezhnev had made a mistake um, and that we returned to, uh, to the positions that we'd started with. All right. And all of this took place about 2.30 in the morning, however. The point I'm trying to make is it is always possible. There are so many detailed and sometimes arcane details that have to be worked out that it is possible that when the two leaders meet alone, just with the interpreters, things can go terribly wrong. Now, Bill Hyland, do, do the advisors sweat that a lot? Uh, very much so. I think the advisors are very nervous once they're excluded from the conversation because you cannot be sure what comes up. You cannot be sure what the record is like if they're, uh, someone is not keeping it. And uh, on occasion, some very serious matters have come up with only the two leaders and their interpreters. All right, talk to me now for a moment, both of you, about, we've just talked about the bad. What's the good side of having two leaders le uh, meet, really privately, as Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Reagan are gonna do tomorrow morning, Arkady? I think that the, uh, it's useful when the two, two leaders, they feel a little bit more free when uh, they have tethered that conversation without the presence of advisors. And, uh, that is a, this is a good side, it's a, it's a human element in the world. I agree with Henry Kissinger that, uh, of course, it's not because of the, this human contact that the, the major issue can be resolved. But I still, I still a believer that, you know, this, uh, this uh, just simple uh, open conversation without the prepared text, without the, this formal set up at the table, they help to establish a kind of a personal rapport uh, between the two leaders which, uh, all in all, is not a minor factor uh, when even it will come to a crisis. Even the character, they measure even the character of each other. And I think that that is, that is, is a good, positive side. And, uh, but uh, certainly a, a negative side, we talk about that. Uh, it uh, could be a, a very tricky misunderstanding, which was a serious uh, and, I would say, even dangerous uh, consequences. Bill, if you had the power to make it happen one way or the other, to say, all right, go ahead and, and have the meeting one-on-one, -on -one, or that's really a bad idea, don't do it, what would you, what would you advise? I think I'd be for the meetings. I think in this, in the nuclear era, the two leaders should get to know each other. They should understand a little of the personalities of the way the minds work. I can't see any great harm in that as long as everything else is, uh, is being handled uh, in, in an orderly way. When you get a message from Brezhnev saying, s threatening to intervene in, in the Middle East, uh, and uh, I think it's important that Nixon and Kissinger and so forth know something about Brezhnev's character. They've seen him. They've They've known him uh, at close range uh, over several meetings. I think that's important for Mr. Reagan and Gorbachev as well. Bill, we have only a few seconds left. Give me a sense of in these one-on-one -on -one discussions, clearly they're not debating details then or, or negotiating details. What are they going to be talking about? What kinds of things? I think they really, at that point, uh, get down to basics and try and uh, give the other side a sense of what is really important. Uh, short speeches, sometimes longer speeches, trying to persuade uh, not, to, not to change minds, 
but to emphasize what's important to them, to give them a sense of priority. That, I think, is what leaders are supposed to do. They're not supposed to negotiate minor details or even very technical subjects, but to present to the other side what is important, uh, to give a sense of, uh, of your conviction. And I think that is what uh, one-on-one talks are all about. William Hyland, our country, Shevchenko, thank you. Comes tonight. Much.